okay, this is session number three out of three. And this is made special for Clubhouse participants. And it's my new book that's not out yet. And so far session one and two covers the science behind Bisnostics. And session three is going to cover executing the science of Bisnostics. So session three is pretty short and it's, it's just a sample of some of the ways that you could execute Bisnostics. Okay, so let's get this thing going. All right, so in the previous sessions, you learned about cognitive versus metacognitive. You also heard about the toolbox. The toolbox is what you do, how you do it, your features and functions, and the details around your offerings. That's all cognitive. And then your audience has to translate that into why they care, which is the metacognitive. Now you're going to learn new terms that go along with that. The first one, and I love this graphic. So you're pretend you're the salesperson over here on the right. Salespeople think their message is brilliant. They've been trained well. They know exactly what to say, and they put together this perfect presentation. And so they're speaking, and look what's happening to the audience's brain. Very rarely does an audience get the message the way it's intended. And why is that? Well, it all goes back to what we talked about earlier. If the salesperson is talking at a cognitive level, the poor audience is having to translate that into the metacognitive, which is how they're going to apply it to the real life. So when a salesperson is talking at a cognitive level, they're talking what I, my term I use is vendor speak. But the client is buying at a metacognitive level and they would rather that you were speaking clients speak to them because you're speaking a different language. You're talking at a different level than what they need you to be on. So if you want both brains to look like the one on the right, which is the salesperson, then you've got to be speaking the same language. You've got to get rid of that translation. That breaks, that gets rid of any of the risk of miscommunication or translation breakdowns or confusion. <laughs> this sounds so logical. Why are we not doing it? It's because so many people are doing it wrong around us. That's the way we think we're supposed to do it. So with this session, this uh, chapter three focuses in on how to speak client speak instead of vendor speak. So one of the things that you're gonna do is focus on the positives. So here's an example. If you reduce costs by 30%, don't say I reduce costs. Think of the glass half empty. Keep all of your words positive because any negative visualizations is going to result in a, the wrong kind of brain chemistry. So I have this really good friend, his name is Joe Ingram, he's the sales genius. And he talks a lot about how your brain cannot translate a negative. So if you say, don't visualize a kitten, you just visualized a kitten. Does that make sense? So if you're going to say you reduced costs by 30%, why not just say you increase profits by 30%? Because if you're reducing the if you're reducing the cost by 30%, you're really increasing the profits by the amount that you're reducing. So say it. Words are unbelievably important and we take them for granted. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. So this little guy with the glass, focus in on the glass is half full. So go back to your marketing messaging right now and look for any words that are not. You cannot, you don't, you won't. Look for those words because that's usually a pretty good indicator that that sentence needs to be reworded to be glass half full versus glass half empty. So keep it positive. Focus on what you do, not what you don't do. Focus on what you increase versus decrease for example. And, you know, how do you get this information? One of the things that I'm blown away by is when I do these workshops and I help my clients, it is shocking to me how few actually go to the clients and find out how they're using the products. So in my, in my, this book, this is my flagship book, the one behind me, 
um, this, the one with two people, the Gnostic Sales and Marketing, everyone should have this book. No, even you should read this book before you read this book because this summarizes this book and look at the difference in sizes. This one has so many stories and visualizations in it. It's, it's my favorite book. So in this book, I talk about my biggest commission check early in my career, um, seven figure ch commission check. I had been selling to a company, the way that my, my client, I mean, my company created a software and this software was created to do a certain function. And we only sold about $150,000 to this huge corporation, but they weren't using it. So I pushed and pushed and pushed for a training session because in the software world, the last thing you want is what we used to call shelfware, where they bought it and didn't use it. You want them to be using it and benefiting from it so that you could grow that $150,000 into a much bigger opportunity. Well, we were, we were in training and I was explaining to them you know, how, how the product worked. And this lady went completely insane. This was a huge auditorium. It was being um, broadcast globally. So we, in the back of the room, I could see monitors of Asia and Africa and Europe and all of these other um, offices that were attending the training too, remotely. And this woman was just going crazy in front of everyone going, you're selling this wrong. You're teaching this wrong. This is not a disaster recovery tool. This is a application management tool. And then she started telling, cause you know, her brain chemistry, I didn't understand at the time. She just seemed crazy to me. She was disrupting the class and getting us off course, but she was having all this positive brain chemistry. I mean, you talk about endorphins. This woman was like running a marathon. She was so excited and hyper because they were about to lose a huge government contract because uh, an application kept crashing and no one could understand why she goes, but I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking at the application. There's a, there's a file, a hidden file. Our virus protection is destroying because they can't identify it. They didn't. Now we know it's associated with this application and that's why it kept crashing. Oh my gosh, this is, we, we've been looking for this for a year. This is a, or one of our biggest contracts. So needless to say that $150,000 sale grew into a huge multi-million dollar sale and it saved a billion dollar contract. So it was a huge RLI for them. So how you think your product works and what you have been taught your product will accomplish might shock you when you go and actually talk to the clients. And I love this little graphic because talk to as many as you can, don't talk to one and get as big of a demographic as you can, a diversity in your selection of clients that you talk to because they all have, you know, one of the things Viznostics teaches is you are who you are because of where you were when. And this was taught by a gentleman named Morris Macy back a long time ago. And it's applicable today more than ever. So get with your clients and find out how they're benefiting from your product. And that is your client speak right? That may not make sense now, but if we had more time, it sure would. Read my book, you'll get it. Okay, so I'm in Clubhouse. You're in Clubhouse. That's why we're watching this or I'm filming this for you. And I hopefully you were just in one of my sessions. One thing I have never done is the hard close. Because remember, people don't like to feel pressured and they don't like to feel manipulated and they don't like to be sold to. It needs to be on their terms and in their, in their decision-making process. A hardcore salesperson doesn't respect that. A person that does can still control the sales cycle, believe it or not, my books teach you how. You can still have control over the sales cycle because you're guiding the client to making the decision for themselves instead of shoving it down their throat and beating them and into submission in order to buy your product. So one of the things Viznostics teaches is hardcore, hardcore closing doesn't work. It might be entertaining to learn. Um, I've been to these classes, but I can tell you in the real world, I beat them almost every single time. And one of the stories I tell in the book is I had a competitor who spent a fortune whining and dining and corporate jets and yachts and 
all of those things to get their clients to come on board. But once they came on board, they treated them very differently and the clients didn't like, didn't decided they wanted to leave. But one of their tactics was if someone decided to leave, they knew exactly what to say, who to say it to, to get that person fired. And they were trained to do that. If someone dare leave them, get them fired. That, that company is out of business today. And I can name five of them that I've competed against and beat them for doing those same tactics tactics and all five are out of business today. But I tell you what, they attract a certain kind of salesperson, somebody that's very competitive, usually an athlete who really is turned on by the thought of, you know, beating their clients into submission. This Gnostics doesn't teach you that. This is not about manipulation. This is about sincerity and caring about people and making it their decision with your help. So it's a different way of selling without manipulating. It's, it's a positive brain chemistry experience and it is the best long-term, I'm still good friends with my clients. It's, that's what you want. The other thing is, it's, you know, hot or cold. I've worked with companies too that had a team of order takers and order takers are the most passive form of salesperson. That also doesn't work. Uh, we, you know, we, we had this one, I was brought in to be part of the, CEO's transformation team. And the first thing I did was said, I wanted to see how y'all are presenting to clients. 187 slides, 187 slides. It took all day. And this company was hemorrhaging. People were leaving them at, at a, an alarming rate because they would put them through a whole day. And the, and the salespeople were proud of it. It's, it, you know, they were proud of their endurance that they could present for a whole day. But they put slide after slide after slide of everything they had. And at the end, they got their little pin out and they were like, okay, so what resonated with you and how much of each thing did you want? It, this is not a menu. You're, what you have is not a menu and it shouldn't be treated or presented as a menu for someone to make a decision so you can take an order. Biznostics is neither one of these things. It's not a passive, it, it's fully in control but it's fully in control in the most scientifically positive way possible. The other thing is when it comes to closing, since we're talking about order taking and closing and stuff, one of the biggest things that I see missing is a call of action, call to action that creates a sense of urgency. And one of the best ways to describe this is, you know, when I write the descriptions for real estate people, one of the things I'll put at the end is, you know, we expect, and, and uh, again, this is only if it's true, but it's, just, I'm giving you just an example. We're having an open house next week and we fully expect multiple offers. Avoid a bidding war and call now and set up a private viewing before the open house. So there's a sense of urgency. There's like a um, call to action and that is something that I see lacking in a lot of cells. And it's a really important thing is to create that sense of urgency. I, I could talk a lot about that, but we're trying to keep it short. And then one of the things that I've said multiple times is words are subjective. And see the little black and white drawing? This is one of the Ed Gorey uh, style drawings that are in my books, black and white cartoons, but you can see what this is. There, there's two people in the audience. They're looking at a slide. It's full of words, bullets and letters. They're having to translate that. And both of them are having two completely different visualizations when they see specific words. Well, the same thing happens with graphics. Look at this cartoon over on the right. Here's three people looking at a tree and they all are visualizing something completely different. So the, the big moral of the stories here on, on application execution is you've got to have both. You've got to have words and your graphics that match and guide the thought process into a visualization where your audiences can see their life better with you in it when they see the combination of the words and the graphics that you're using. So that's it. There's a whole lot more, but this is all I'm willing to share on Clubhouse. So thank you very much for your time and have a business day.